Well, good morning, and uh, thank you so much to the praise team for leading us in worship this morning. That was wonderful. Uh, what an awesome kids video. That was, that was amazing. Um, we're going to keep that in our minds this morning because we're going to be fast-forwarding a little bit in the story of Samuel's life to the time when he was an old man. So not when he was a child, but an old man. Um, but before we get to um, the word of the Lord this morning, I invite you to pray with me as we ask the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to us this morning. Will you bow your hearts? Lord God, help us to turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. Because Lord, you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you have a Bible with you this morning, an electronic version or a hard copy, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV today, um, and we're going to be reading 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel, all of chapter 8, verses 1 to 22. And so the title in my Bible is Israel Asks for a King, although some of it might, some versions might say Israel Demands a King or Israel Wants a King. So is Israel Asks for a King, 1 Samuel chapter 8. <clears throat> When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and said, and the Lord said to him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. <clears throat> Excuse me. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assigned to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and, your, and yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king that you have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen. They refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. So when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. So then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to his town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so as we unpack this portion of God's word this morning, let me first just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'll start by saying that I am the worship director at Hebron Christian Reformed Church in Whitby, so I've got the same job that William has. Um, I'm a commissioned pastor. I was commissioned for my role in worship a few years ago, um, and now I'm a student at Calvin Seminary. And I'm married to my wonderful wife, Carrie, who is here with me this morning. I'm a musician, I play the guitar, and the last thing I want to tell you about myself is that I'm a Leafs fan. I grew up cheering for the Toronto Maple Leafs, 
And a few years ago, things started to look pretty good for our team. They acquired some star players, and things were looking up. Just before the start of the 2019-2020 NHL season, if you can remember back that far, John Tavares was named captain of our beloved Toronto Maple Leafs. And this was a position that had been vacant for three years at that point. So the anticipation surrounding and the surrounding controversy about who would wear that capital C on their jersey, it captivated the hearts and minds of Leaf fans everywhere. Because a new captain is a show of confidence from leadership. It's management saying, yes, we believe in you, that you have the talent and maturity and the leadership to take our team to the next level. And yet, even with this new appointed leadership, Leafs Nation suffered another disappointing season that year. And then again, another disappointing end of the season this year. Because it's all Leafs fans have ever wanted. A team that will not disappoint them time and time again. See, in our text this morning, we're jumping into a pivotal moment in Israel's history. One where they've decided to choose their own captain of sorts. A king. One who they hope will lead them to prosperity and one who will never disappoint. Israel finds itself at a crossroads. Samuel, the judge, their leader, he had grown old and the elders had been making plans for the futures. You can imagine that awkward conversation when the elders of Israel approach Samuel and they say, hey, Samuel, listen, you've been great, but you're well past the age of retirement now. You're getting a little long in the tooth, and it's about time we think about the future. You know, when you're not here to lead us anymore. We know that you've put your sons in place, but you have to admit, they're not suitable replacements. Their track record isn't so good. And you know our neighbors, they seem to be doing pretty well. They've all got kings. So we've taken all of this into consideration and we've decided that that's what's best for Israel too. We've done the critical analysis, we've made all the plans, now we just need someone who fits the job description. We want a king. And so Samuel brought all this before the Lord in prayer. He says, God, the people want a king. I'm just not cutting it anymore. Maybe I'm slowing down in my old age. Whatever it is, they've rejected me. And God speaks to Samuel saying, no, no, Samuel, it's not you they've rejected. This has nothing to do with your age. They said their desire for a king is about you, but really, it's about me. They're rejecting me. You see, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with their desire for a king. I even spoke through Moses that once the people had been established in the promised land as they are now, that they would ask for a king, but warn them that if I give Israel what they're asking for, things won't turn out the way they think they will. All this is because they're asking for the wrong reasons. Having a king of their choosing won't lead to prosperity. No, tell them, your new king might look good and attractive at first, but in the end, he'll treat you and your children just like animals. He'll claim everything you have as his own, take a tenth of it from you, and even you, the people who crowned him and elevated him into power, even you will become his slaves. And none of this is unfair. It's simply the consequence of your choice. So when Samuel conveys all this to the elders, only then did they really show their true colors, right? They said, no, we want a king over us because then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. We want the person who rules over us to lead us to greater and greater victories. We want a king who really looks like a king, a true rival to our enemies, and someone that we'll be proud to serve. So again, Samuel brings us before the Lord. He says, God, you warned Israel what would go wrong if they chose a king by themselves. Not only does Israel persist anyway, they reveal that their true motive is a bigger problem than they initially let on. 
their purpose, their desire is to be like the nations, even though your plan for us to be a holy nation was so clear. In Leviticus uh, chapter 20, 26, you say to Israel, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Lord, you were right when you said this is not a rejection of me, this is a rejection of you. Israel wants a king of their own making in place of you, the Lord, their God. And God answers, I think Samuel listened to them. Give them a king. You can hear the pain and disappointment in his voice. The pain and disappointment in God's answer. He says, fine, listen to them. Give them a king. God hands Israel over to the consequences of their decision. God hands Israel over to their misplaced desire for a king. Now, I have an old friend, um, someone I don't see very often anymore, even less now because of COVID. He's not a believer, and yet we share a very special relationship because he loves to ap- ask deep questions, and he won't shy away from Um, those topics that you're supposed to avoid in polite dinner conversation, politics and religion. Despite the polarizing nature of these topics, that's not the type of debate we have where tempers flare and voices raise. No, he genuinely asks deep and thoughtful questions about the nature of my faith, how I see the world as a Christian believer, questions that we ought to take seriously instead of spouting out the Sunday school answer. Uh, Last time I saw him, he started the line of questioning pretty innocently enough. He said, Daniel, how is seminary going? What are you learning in this class? What are you learning in that class? And no matter where he starts, it always boils down to the same core issue. Daniel, he says, it's good to hear you characterize God like that, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. But that sounds like a different God than the one I see Christians worshiping all around me. The God of their worship, well, he's full of hate. Hate for the foreigner, hate for social justice, hate for minority communities, a lover of temporary band-aid solutions, but not of any meaningful systematic change, nothing that might upset the status quo or help the next generation. How can the God you say that is so full of compassion and grace also be so distant, so uncompromising and short-sighted. If the God of the Bible is the way you describe him, then who is the God of North American Christianity? That God must be a fallacy. And you might have rebuttals to the specifics of his arguments. But the concern behind all the others is this. Why are you Christians so hypocritical? What's the explanation for the disparity between the God who so loves the world that he would die for it and the people who claim to love him in return but in reality often live like everybody else, always seeking their own interest? As if God's existence is of no consequence. As if Superficial change is all that God would ever really ask of us. Rather than point the finger at others, maybe we need to first ask ourselves if we're playing a part because we see God not as he is, but as we want him to be. Like Israel, we elevate things of the surrounding nations to the throne of our own hearts. Can we truly be said to worship the God of the Bible if we hold on to secular idols? When I elevate my reputation, or my success, or wealth, or my comfort, my talents, my culture, or anything else, when I elevate those things to an unhealthy degree, I create caveats within Christianity. Living as a Christian means loving my neighbor as myself, unless loving my neighbor means wearing a mask. Living as a Christian means loving the Lord your God unless loving the Lord your God means forsaking my reputation. 
when I hold up these beliefs as caveats to Christianity, when I elevate them up to a place where I can only accept God if he grants me this concession, then I'm not really accepting God as he is. I'm not truly worshiping the God of the Bible. I'm rejecting him and crowning another in his place. The idol of reputation, the idol of success or wealth. Maybe it's the idol of my inalienable rights as a citizen. Whatever that idol is, whatever we have a tendency to crown as king in our hearts, I can't answer that question for you. The Holy Spirit will convict us of those idols. Point out the places in our lives where we are reluctant to surrender control to the true king. What's most troubling is that, like Israel, God will hand us over to the consequences of our new king if we persist in worshiping them. If we persist in crowning another king over our lives, and you're free to do so, but you've already been warned of the consequences. You've been warned that those desires will rule you like a king who promises prosperity but ultimately enslaves his subjects and leads them towards death and defeat. And that's what the people of Israel are asking for when they ask for a king. The request wasn't simple or innocent even. There were strings attached. Israel wanted a king so that they could be like the nations around them. Israel wanted God to provide a king, but only if they could have a king on their own terms. But the good news in all of this is that God's grace is ever abounding in the series of events, the series of events that unfolds even out of Israel's brazen rejection of him. God took Israel's brokenness and their sinful reliance on a king of their own making, a king of this world, and he brought salvation for his hurting creation out of that broken decision. After he anoints Saul as king, Israel, it comes time for um, Samuel to leave the people of Israel with their new ruler. Despite their rejection of God, he reassures Israel. Samuel says, don't be afraid. He reassures them. You have certainly done wrong, but make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart. Don't turn your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping worthless idols. Don't go back to looking to those idols that cannot help you or rescue you because they're totally useless. The Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name. For it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. And as for me, Samuel, I'll continue to pray for you. I'll continue to teach you what is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things that he's done for you. But if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. This isn't the end of God's work in the history of Israel's kings. He doesn't leave them with the instructions to worship him faithfully or else. Instead, only because of his sheer grace, God brings out of this succession of kings one who finally rules his people in accordance with his will. Remember that after Saul came David, a man after God's own heart, one who was small in stature and unimpressive to the eyes of men, completely unlike Saul. From David's line is born in Bethlehem the salvation that Israel was looking for all along, the salvation Israel first sought in their king instead of in God. Finally, God says, no, enough is enough. For the people of Israel, this moment comes in the person of Jesus Christ. In Christ, God says, Your sin has led to death and destruction. Even though you've chosen your own ill-advised course of action, I will providentially use your nation's kings to bring about my purposes. In the person of Jesus Christ, my son, I've restored myself as Israel's rightful king. Part of the reason that I can have this 
ongoing and recurring conversation with my friend about God's place in my life is that everyone can relate to misplaced loyalties. Whether it's a broken heart or a lost job, a hurtful comment from a friend or a spouse, uh, someone, even from someone you admire, or another first round ejection from the playoffs. Every king of our own making that we could ever enthrone will leave us desperately unhappy. It'll leave us totally empty the very moment that we fail, the moment that we fall short. In the person of Jesus Christ, God restores himself not only as Israel's king, but God restores himself as our true king. So the answer to my friend's complaint about hypocritical Christians is always the same because unlike the kings of our own making, my God is unchanging. Even though we will certainly fall short, I know my God never will. I can say with complete confidence, friend, my hope for tomorrow is not in what I own or the esteem I can earn. My hope for tomorrow is not in any fallible thing. My God can never let me down because his character is exactly as he says it is. It's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Pastor Tim Keller says it best in his book, The Reason for God. He says, Jesus is the only Lord who, if you receive him, will fulfill you completely. And if you fail him, will forgive you eternally. Can we really say that about the kings of our own making? As God has already done the hard work of exalting himself as king and inaugurating his kingdom in a world that's stained with sin. God's kingdom is unlike any that a king of our making would create or sustain. Because God's kingdom is upside down and it's backwards. A kingdom where the currency is selflessness, generosity, love, and the blood of God himself. Christ was exalted and lifted up, crowned the king of creation that day on the cross. His life sacrificed as an inaugural gift. Christ is one for us, not an obligation to fulfill or a prize that we must earn. With Christ as the king of your life, you are made heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. And all of this doesn't mean that we're free to go on then living as we wish, hating our neighbor, because then we're back in the company of the hypocrite. Those who claim Jesus as their king, so long as he operates by the caveats and the stipulations that they put in place. No. Christ as king of your life means that God has freed you to live out of his grace rather than to live up to an unattainable standard. So people of God, know that he alone is king. That Christ has claimed his rightful place as king over your life. And unlike any king of our own making, his love will never fail. Amen? Will you join me as we pray? Holy God, you alone are worthy of praise. You alone are worthy to be called king. You alone are worthy to be crowned Lord of all. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning that indeed you are our king, that through Jesus Christ, your son, you've claimed for yourself all of creation, even the throne of our stubborn hearts. God, work in us to transform us more and more into your likeness. Reveal to us the places in our lives where we've been stubborn, where we've elevated something or someone to your rightful place in our hearts. So God, thank you that you alone are our hope, that you alone have defeated the power of sin and death, that you alone through your Holy Spirit live within us, 
and give us strength for today. Thank you, God, for your unchanging character that our hope for tomorrow is found in you, in your compassion, in your grace, in your slowness to anger, your steadfast love for us. God, we marvel at what you've accomplished for us in spite of our sinfulness. That you made a way to come as the true king. That you were enthroned on the cross. Your exaltation not by the means of the world, but through our own, your own suffering. So Lord Jesus, as we go out from this place, may your spirit be ever present in us. Calling us to repentance of the places in our lives where we put you second. And living in us that we might know the goodness of your love each and every day. Lord, we crown you as king over our lives. So help us to look to you alone for our hope. All this we pray in your holy name. Amen.